Hello and welcome everybody to this talk. I would like to thank everybody for being here today and especially the people from Testing Stage for inviting me. Today I will talk about design patterns to boost, to boost your test automation. My name is Christian Baumann and I'm a software tester at Maibon Wolf. In my free time, I like spending time with my family, reading fantasy books, riding my motorbike, learn about testing and coding, and I also play the clarinet and the saxophone in a band. And Lego even made a minifigure out of me. For more info about me, you can check out my Twitter and Mastodon. There's a link to my different profiles in my bio. Let me ask you how your test automation journey is going. You're working on test automation, yet didn't receive any proper training. You managed to create some automated tests, but you suspect that something is not quite right with your automation because your code feels messy and maintaining it is difficult and very frustrating. Programmers have tools to handle this. One group of those being called design patterns. Four IBM programmers nicknamed the Gang of Four first created the term. They state a design pattern is a description of customized communication objects and classes that solves the problem in a particular context of, of software design. Put more simply, a design pattern is a common way of building things that solves a known problem. If you're creating test automation, then you are doing software design. Yet a lot of test automation engineers are not aware of many or any design patterns that could ease their work. This is a pity because using design patterns has quite some advantages. After we clar clarified what this talk is about, let's go over what else we will talk about. Some history and theory of design patterns, some example design patterns and how to use them in the context of test automation. How to get started with design patterns and finally, drawbacks and limitations of design patterns. Let's start. So how did this whole design pattern thing start? It was this four gentlemen, Eric Gamma, Rickard Helm, Ralph Johnson, and John Flissides, who, while reviewing code systems they were working on, began noticing patterns and problems and the solutions to them. Since these solutions to common repeating problems were being repeated over and over in various projects, they began putting a name to them to describe the solutions in detail. Over time, and after much trial and error, they came up with 23 patterns and described them in their book. This book was first published in 1994 and is still considered one of the most popular books to learn design patterns today. The authors initiated the concept of design patterns in software development. As mentioned before, these authors are collectively known as Gang of Four. According to that book, there are three types of design patterns, creational, behavioral, and structural. Creational design patterns, provide ways to create objects while hiding the creation logic instead of instantiating objects directly using the new operator. This gives the program more flexibility in deciding which objects need to be created for a given use case. Behavioral design patterns deal with class and object composition. The concept of inheritance is used to compose interfaces and define ways to compose objects to obtain new functionality. Structural design patterns are specifically concerned with the communication between objects. Design patterns usually consist of four elements, the name, the problem description, a solution, and the consequences of using the pattern. The name of the pattern is a one or two word description that pattern literate programmers who are familiar with patterns can use to communicate with each other. 
Examples of names are factory method or mediator. The name of the pattern should recall the problem it solves and the solution. The problem the pattern solves includes a general intent and a more specific motivation or two. For instance, the intent of the singleton pattern is to prevent more than one instance of a class from being created. A motivating example might be to not allow more than one object to try to access a system's audio hardware at the same time by only allowing a single audio object. The solution to the problem specifies the elements that make up the pattern, such as the specific classes, methods, interfaces, data structures, and algorithms. The solution also includes the relationships, responsibilities, and collaborators of the different elements. Indeed, these interrelationships and structure are generally more important to the pattern than the individual pieces, which may change without significantly changing the pattern. Often more than one pattern can solve a problem. Thus, the determining factor is often the consequences of the pattern. Some patterns take up more space and some take up more time. In addition, some patterns are more scalable than others. After knowing what design patterns are and what they consist of, we also should talk about what they are not. Design patterns are not algorithms. You can't just select a pattern and paste it into your program like a library because it is not a specific piece of code. Design patterns are more high-level descriptions of a solution that is meant to provide a guidance on structure, relations, and hierarchy of an object, as well as classes and interfaces in the application. The solid principles are used in most of the design patterns. I thus think it's beneficial to have at least a basic understanding of these principles before getting deeper into design patterns. The goal of applying solid principles is to create software that is understandable, readable, changeable, extensible, and maintainable. I will not go into detail here, but only briefly explain the principles. Single responsibility states that a class should be responsible for only one thing. Open closed means that entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Lisco substitution, a superclass that can be replaced by a subclass without changing the code's behavior. Interface segregation, a class shouldn't depend on methods it doesn't use. Dependency inversion states that high-level modules should not import anything from low-level modules and abstractions should not depend on details. We will get back to some of those later on. Now, let's have a closer look at these design patterns and how they can be used in the context of test automation. The intent of the builder pattern is to separate the construction of a complex object from its representation, so that the same construction process can create different representations. The builder pattern can be used when the algorithm for creating a complex object should be independent of the parts that make up the object and how they are assembled. The construction process must allow different representations for the object that's constructed. The problem we're often facing in our tests is that the tests are bound to a constructor. The builder pattern can resolve that dependency. Let's implement it step by step. In a production environment, you want encapsulation, constraints, and other limitations. Under test, however, you want to expose units so that you can test them in isolation. Let's take a look at a small example where these goals are conflicting. This is a simplified version of a typical domain class. It has the following characteristics. All values are passed in the constructor. All properties are read only, at least from outside of this class. The methods get full name and get age provide access to calculated values. <laughs> 
Now, let's look at a simpler, simple test for the get full name method. This simple test constructs an employee. It then calls the get full name method and then checks that the return value is correct. The problem here is that we're tied to the constructor. In order to construct the employee, apart from relevant data, first name and last name, we also need to pass in an ID, a birth date and a street. This data is completely irrelevant for this test. This has two consequences. Our test is not as expressive as it could be. The irrelevant data pollutes our test. From just looking at the test, it's not clear whether they influence the outcome or not. In this example, it might be obvious, but in a real situation, that's not always the case. If at any given point in time, we need to add an unrelated item to the constructor, it will break the test and we need to modify it. This is not a big problem for a single test, but it can become a maintenance nightmare if you have to construct employee objects in a lot of different tests. You can see the problem with two different goals here. For our production code, we want the employee class to be immutable. This way, the employee class can encapsulate its data and assure that operations work on the correct data that has not been tampered with. For our test, however, we would like to be able to only provide some data so we can test the relevant methods. One route to take would be to create an overloaded constructor on the employee class and establish a convention that always the full-fledged constructor should be used. But this is not optimal, since you will end up with a lot of conventions, which are then forgotten and it can affect your production code. This is exactly the opposite of what we want to achieve with tests. In essence, the problem we're facing is that our test is bound to the constructor. The first step is to create a class with a method that creates an employee. This step is fairly simple. This will be our replacement for the direct constructor call we previously had in our test. It constructs an employee based on some private fields. In order for our builder to be useful, we need to be able to modify the values of these private fields. We can do this by implementing some modification methods. With these methods in place, first name and last name can now be modified before constructing the object. This is an example of the usage. As you can see, we have now decoupled the construction from the constructor and provided an API for constructing employee objects. However, we can still improve on the pattern. The following two steps are optional, but since they don't require a lot of work, I would recommend implementing them as well, since it vastly improves the expressiveness of your tests. In order to make our client code a bit more concise, we can implement a Fluent API. We can do this by modifying the modifier methods. As you can see, instead of returning void, all methods now return the current instance. This allows us to chain the methods and rewrite our client code to this. Applying the builder pattern has some advantages. Hide the details that are irrelevant to the test so that only relevant data for that particular test is present. Expressiveness. By explicitly passing just the necessary data, we improve the value of our unit tests as a form of documentation. Just by looking at the test, you can determine what the method does. Flexibility. By decoupling the test from the constructor, we made sure that future changes won't break our existing tests. This is important for maintenance reasons, e.g. you don't want to go in and change a lot of tests because of some code changes. Reliability. Because our test is flexible to what changes, you won't have to modify it often. In general, an automated test gets more reliable when it matures. To imagine this, you can compare the effect of a failing automated test that you just wrote over one that has written has been written a month ago. A recently written test that fails can have a lot of reasons, e.g. an error in the test, 
some code that is not written yet, etc. On the other hand, a test that has been working for months but suddenly fails is more concerning and will most definitely indicate a problem with new code. Let's discuss the next pattern, the decorator pattern. The intent of the decorator pattern is to attach additional responsibilities to an object dynamically. Decorators provide a flexible alternative to subclassing for extending functionality. Let's have a look at an example. In this example, I will illustrate the use of decorators using a coffee making scenario. For simplicity reasons, the scenario only includes cost and ingredients. The coffee interface defines the functionality of coffee implemented by the decorator. It has two methods to be implemented, get cost, which returns the cost of the coffee, and get ingredients, which returns the ingredients of the coffee. This is an extension of a simple copy without any extra ingredients. This is an abstract decorator class that implements the coffee interface. And here are two decorators with milk and with sprinkles. Note that both extend the abstract coffee decorator and override the get cost and get ingredients methods. And finally, here's a test program that creates different coffee instances with different levels of decorations. Simple coffee, so not decorated at all. Coffee with milk, coffee with sprinkles, and last but not least, coffee with milk and sprinkles. A more realistic scenario to use the decorator example in the context of test automation is when e.g. a web application is changing a lot and A-B tests have to be performed on component level. Using the decorator pattern, you don't need to write a new class for each characteristic, but you only have to implement the differences as a decorator. You can find more information about this specific example in Benjamin Bischoff's great article, Common UI Automation Patterns and Methodologies, on the Ministry of Testing website. A link to that article can be found in the resource section of the slides. So in summary, we can say, use the decorator pattern to add responsibilities to individual objects dynamically and transparently, that is, without affecting other objects for responsibilities that can be withdrawn when extension by subclassing is impractical. Sometimes a large number of independent extensions are possible and would produce an explosion of subclasses to support every combination. Or a class definition may be hidden or otherwise unavailable for subclassing. The strategy pattern's intent is to define a family of algorithms encapsulate each one and make them interchangeable. This means, instead of implementing a single algorithm directly, code receives runtime instructions as to which in a family of algorithms to use. Strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from clients that use it, deferring the decision about which algorithm to use until runtime allows the calling code to be more flexible and reusable. One example could be a user registration you perform in your tests. For user re registration, you might want to have two different implementations of this particular action. The first one would be the actual flow of transitions through the UI for successful user registration. The other one would be a short API call which is invoked when a new user is needed for the test. You may not want to invoke the long registration via the UI every time in your tests, but sometimes you need it. For example, when you want to validate the actual registration through the web. And vice versa, we need a new user creation for tests to be fast and reliable. That's why the registration via REST API would be suitable here. 
you can use strategy pattern when many related classes differ only in their behavior. Strategies provide a way to configure a class with one of many behaviors. When you need different variants of an algorithm, for example, you might define algorithms reflecting different space-time trade-offs. Strategies can be used when these variants are implemented as a class hierarchy of algorithms. An algorithm uses data that clients should know about. Use the strategy pattern to avoid exposing complex algorithm-specific data structures. A class defines many behaviors and these appear as multiple conditional statements in its operations. Instead of many conditionals, move related conditional branches into their own strategy class. The intent of the singleton pattern is to ensure a class only has one instance and provide a global point of access to it. For example, you have multiple config files holding the values of e.g. credentials, URLs, and so on of the different environments you're working in. You only want one instance of this configuration in your test framework. Let me quote the Design Patterns book on this. How do we ensure that a class has only one instance and that the instance is easily accessible? A global variable makes an object accessible, but it doesn't keep you from instantiating multiple objects. A better solution is to make the class itself responsible for keeping track of its sole instance. The class can ensure that no other instance can be created by intercepting requests to create new objects and it can provide a way to access the instance. This is the singleton pattern. To create a singleton class, the constructor needs to be private. There needs to be a static reference of the class to make it available globally. And a static method needs to be in place, which returns an object of the class and also checks whether the class is already initiated. In this example, we have two objects which are instantiating the singleton web driver class twice, but it will be instantiated only once. Both web driver and another web driver are referencing the same object. This ensures that only a single web driver is used in all of our tests. Benefits of the singleton pattern are, for example, then the singleton class controls how and when clients can use its instance. Also, by prohibiting new instances of the class, it's using less memory. But be careful. A lot of people consider the singleton pattern to be an anti-pattern. Here are some reasons for that. Singletons violate the single responsibility principle. A class should only be responsible for one clearly defined task. On the other hand, a singleton has at least two tasks. In addition to the actual task, it must also ensure that there's no other of its kind. It introduces unnecessary restrictions. If in a later program version more than one instance is needed, the singleton must be removed. It's tightly coupled. A singleton is easy to implement only in sequential programs. In concurrent programs, it's a challenge. There's quite some controversy about this among programmers, and I wanted to make you aware of the potential problems with the singleton pattern as per my perception, this isn't pointed out enough when the patterns being discussed in the context of test automation. I encourage everybody to educate themselves on the topic and decide if the singleton pattern can be used without problems in your own context, since every context is different. Maybe the best known design pattern in test automation is the page object model. It models the application under, that, under test, thus, keeps the tests independent from the implementation details of the software under test and reduces maintenance efforts when the application changes. I think the page object is pretty overrepresented when it comes to talking about design patterns in test automation. So instead of going into details about its advantages, functionalities, and how to use it, I will instead present some of the issues of the page object. The page object model has been introduced to reduce maintenance issues, which often have been mistaken as Selenium issues rather than issues with the coding practices of the people writing tests. Page objects can be a good starting point, but there are some problems that can be solved by refactoring applying solid object-oriented principles. At the time, the page object model has been invented 
Selenium and WebDriver have been used more and more by testing teams who quite often did not have extensive programming skills and that many times resulted in tests with a lot of reputation and inconsistencies. Page objects are a solution that is good enough to prevent test code becoming too riddled with code smells and they also made test automation more available to test automators just scripting their tests who didn't have much object-oriented programming knowledge. But page objects still cause maintenance overhead, which unfortunately a lot of teams don't even realize. Let's talk about some code smells in the page object model. But what are code smells? Smells are certain structures in the code that indicate violation of fundamental design principles and negatively impact design quality. Code smells are usually not bugs. They are not technically incorrect and do not prevent the program from functioning. Instead, they indicate weaknesses in design that may slow down development or increase the risk of bugs or failures in the future. Code smells can be an indicator of factors that contribute to technical debt. The code smell to be found most often in the page objects is the long class. Problems caused by the long class are, it's hard to find things, it's difficult to maintain, and it does not fit in my head. Besides that, large classes are indicators that other programming principles are not followed as well. E.g., it's very likely that the single responsibility principle, remember the S in solid, is not applied. And also the chances for duplicate code are higher which often results in buggy and inconsistent behavior. In favor of brevity, let's focus on only two of the solid principles when investigating the page object pattern, the single responsibility principle and the open close principle. The single responsibility principle states that a class should be responsible for only one thing and thus should only have one reason to change resulting in a reduced risk of changes affecting other unrelated behaviors. But page objects usually have two responsibilities. They bring an abstraction to the location of the elements of the page, and they provide tasks that can be done on a page. Having both of these responsibilities in one class means if how a specific element is located, changes the class needs to be changed, but it also needs to be changed when how a task is executed changes. So there are two reasons for change, which violates the single responsibility principle. The open closed principle states that entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification, meaning it should be feasible to extend behavior without modifying existing code, which results in leaving old code in place and only adding new code. Let's say we have a to-do list application and the corresponding to-do list page and the functionality to sort items. The usual approach is to modify the to-do list page with a method that handles this. To follow the open close principle, a simple approach could be to split the classes into smaller page objects and additional behavior would mean a new class. This would satisfy the open close principle but violate the single responsibility principle as still the responsibilities of locating elements and executing tasks would be in one class. Another simple approach that would satisfy the single responsibility principle would be to have one class for locating elements and a second one for, for, for performing tasks, but that would not be in line with the open close principle. Besides the problems of not satisfying the solid principles, a lot of user behavior spans more than a single page. Instead, what a user does can be expressed better in behaviors rather than thinking in pages. We'll see how to handle this in a better way in the next pattern I will present. The screenplay pattern, or formerly known as the journey pattern, is around since 2007. So it's not in the Gang of Four Design Patterns book, which has been published in 1994. I especially want to point out that it developed independently from the page object pattern. Some say it can be seen as an evolution of the page object pattern that evolves from applying solid programming principles to resolve the anti-patterns that are built into the page object pattern. In screenplay, the central item is an actor, which represents an application user. Actors have abilities. E.g., 
If there's a browsed web ability, which just provides a Selenium web driver object, or call a REST API is ability, which holds an OK HTTP client. Abilities enable actors to perform tasks, which consist of actions. The only method implemented by a task is the performed as method, which takes an actor as an argument. Here, it can be very seductive to use page objects for further structuring of the code, which is highly discouraged by the inventors of screenplay. Instead, they recommend to put technical details, waiting logic, element selectors, and so on, right there in the task. Following these rules solves two issues. Interactions can only go into a task. No question about that. Interactions are always tied to an intent and context, which makes analyzing failures much easier. Following this rule also helps with optimization for the correct objective of a task. For example, when searching for items, it is mandatory to wait for the search field to be clickable. But when doing a login, this can be completely ignored. As we have seen in the previous code snippet, actions interact with elements on a screen. Questions are quite similar to tasks, with the distinction between those two approaches is that a question returns something that enables us to get information about the application under test. Here we see an example implementation of a question. And this is an example of a user registration that includes entering email address, personal information and address, which each would be models as own entities. In summary, we can say that the screenplay pattern aims at writing tests like screenplays by structuring complex test code in a way that makes it more readable, reusable, and maintainable. It does that by taking a user-centric and object-oriented view on things. In screenplay, a user is represented as an actor. Actors can have abilities, and abilities enable them to do tasks or answer questions. In screenplay, each of these concepts actor, ability, task, and question are objects which abstract from the actual actions. The article from Page Objects Refactored Solid Steps to the Screenplay Journey Pattern from Anthony Machano and others describes in way more detail how and why the page object pattern violates good coding practices. And it also lays out in a very detailed way on how to get from the page object pattern to the screenplay pattern by applying the solid principles. A link to that article can be found in the resource section of the slides. So having heard about the solid principles, advantages and disadvantages of design patterns, as well as having seen some examples, how to get started using them. There's a lot of design patterns existing, and we most likely cannot remember them all just after reading a book or having heard a presentation about them. The most important thing is to know that design patterns exist. Second important thing is to know what problem we are trying to solve. This with the help of knowing about solid and other programming principles and if they are violated. We then can learn more about patterns that are trying to solve those problems. A good start for this can be to look at example code and also to look at benefits and drawbacks of specific patterns you're evaluating. With so many design patterns existing, it can be difficult to find that one that addresses your specific problem best, especially if you are new to the concept of design patterns. I will thus propose a few different approaches on how to find the right design pattern that's right for your problem. No need to apply all of those. They can be used independently or in combination. Examine how design problems are solved by design patterns. This means analyze the patterns for your appropriate objects, object granularity and interfaces in which they could solve your problem. The Design Patterns book has its own more than 20 pages long chapter, How Design Patterns Solve Design Problems on this. Go through the intents of each pattern. This in order to find one or more that might be relevant for solving your problem. Using a classification scheme like the one shown from the Gang of Four book can be used to narrow the search. 
The graphic shows interrelations between some design patterns. To study these relationships can be helpful to find the right pattern or the right group of patterns. Study patterns of similar purpose. Analyze them per group, credential, creational, structural, behavioral, and look at differences, similarities, and contrasts in order to decide which one fits your problem. Research the cause of your wanted redesign. Some potential causes are listed on the slides. There's more with detailed explanations in the Game of Four book. Check those and the descriptions to find the pattern that helps you to avoid the cause of a redesign. Consider what should be changeable in your design. This is the opposite approach to examining the cause of redesign. With this approach, you should think about what should be changeable without a redesign while focusing on isolating the concept that is varying. When you've decided for a design pattern, how to use it, I will present one of many potential step-by-step -step approaches on how to apply design pattern effectively. Read the pattern to get an overview, especially consider, consider if it's applicable and what consequences it has to be sure it is right for your problem. Again, analyze structure and participants and be sure to understand classes and objects and how they relate to each other. Study some sample code to have seen a concrete example in code. This helps you to learn about how to implement the pattern. Choose meaningful names for the participants of the pattern in the context of the application. To get back to our strategy pattern example, name the different strategies accordingly. We named them API user registration and web user registration because it helps to make implementation of the pattern more meaningful. Define the classes, declare their interfaces, establish their inheritance relationships, and define the instance variables that represent data and object references. Identify existing classes in your application that the pattern will affect and modify them accordingly. Operations in the pattern should be named application specific. Again, usually the names depend on the application. Responsibilities and collaborations associated with each operations can be used for guidance. It's also important to be consistent with the names. Implement the operations to carry out the responsibilities and collaborations in the pattern. Here's some example code can be really helpful. This is just one approach that can help you get started. With practice and over time, you will build your own approach of how to use and apply design patterns. Of course, we also need to talk about how not to use design patterns. They should not be used aimlessly. Very often, the advantages like flexibility and variability cause additional levels of indirection to be introduced, which can cost performance and or complicate the design. Only when the provided flexibility of a design pattern is really needed, the pattern should be used. Checking out the consequences upfront can be very helpful to figure out the pattern's advantages and liabilities. Using design patterns can also have negative implications, which need to be taken care of, or at least to be considered. Patterns do not lead to direct code reuse. Patterns can be deceptively simple. Teams may suffer from patterns overload. Integrating patterns into a software development process is a human intensive activity. This was my talk. Many thanks for your attention. I will share the slides on LinkedIn, Mastodon, and Twitter. At the very end, there's a resource section with links to articles and talks for your further learnings. I hope you find some useful bits for your work. See you next time. Bye-bye.